Hi, I'm Richard Pratt from Third Millennium Ministries, and I'm delighted that you've decided to study the fifth session of this special Study at Home series on the book of Hebrews. Up to this point, we've seen that the book of Hebrews exhorted first century Jewish Christians to turn away from false teachings and to remain fully devoted to Christ. Now we're going to see how the author of Hebrews tried to convince these early Jewish Christians to follow Christ by repeating in every section of his book that Jesus brings the last days or the latter days of world history. Few things were more important to first century Jews than their hope that the Messiah would bring the greatest judgments and blessings the world had ever seen in the last days. And the book of Hebrews demonstrates that Jesus is the one who fulfills this hope. Now, most first century Jews believed that the Messiah would fulfill their hopes for the last days suddenly or all at once. But we're going to see how the book of Hebrews teaches the wonderful Christian truth that Christ actually unfolds the hopes of the last days in three historical periods in the inauguration of his kingdom 2,000 years ago, in the continuation of his kingdom throughout church history, and in the consummation of his kingdom when he returns in glory. We often find ourselves in situations where we want to persuade people to agree with us. There are many ways to do this, but one of the most effective ways is to build as much as possible on beliefs that we already hold in common. Then on the basis of that common ground, we can try to convince them of other matters. In many respects, this is what the author of the book of Hebrews did. He wrote to a church that was tempted to seek safety from persecution by returning to teachings held by their local Jewish community. So to persuade them to remain faithful to Christ, he built a case as much as he could on the basis of beliefs that he and his audience held in common. This is the second lesson in our series, The Book of Hebrews, and we've entitled it Content and Structure. In this lesson, we'll see how the author of Hebrews followed this persuasive strategy as he exhorted his audience to renew their commitment to Christ. Our lesson on the content and structure of Hebrews will be divided into two parts. First, we'll see the recurring content that appears in every major division of the book. Second, we'll explore Hebrews' rhetorical structure, how the author wove these recurring elements into persuasive presentations. Let's look first at the recurring content of Hebrews. In our preceding lesson, we summarized the overarching purpose of the book of Hebrews in this way. The author of Hebrews wrote to exhort his audience to reject local Jewish teachings and to remain faithful to Jesus. At this point in our lesson, we want to see how the author accomplished his purpose by using similar elements over and over. A closer look at the recurring content of Hebrews reveals that the author fulfilled his overarching purpose by repeating three main elements. First, he called attention to the fact that history had reached its last days in Jesus. Second, he presented Old Testament support for this belief. And third, he offered his audience a number of exhortations to persevere in their Christian faith. Let's begin with the author's belief that the last days had come in Jesus. For the most part, when followers of Christ hear the expression, last days, their minds go directly to events surrounding Christ's returning glory. Many of us spend a lot of time and effort trying to understand events like the Great Tribulation, the Rapture, and the Millennium. But when we speak of the last days in the book of Hebrews, we have in mind something that is much broader than events closely related to the second advent of Christ. Christian theologians often refer to the Bible's teaching on the last days as eschatology. This technical term derives from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or final. 
Interestingly, this New Testament terminology appears in the Old Testament as early as the mention of the latter days in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. There, Moses warned that Israel would go into exile if they rebelled against God. But he assured them that in the latter days, if they repented, they would return from exile to incomparable blessings from God. And Old Testament prophets also spoke of events associated with Israel's return from exile as happening in the last days. It isn't difficult to see from Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 that the author of Hebrews had eschatology on his mind as he wrote his book. Listen to the very first thing he wrote. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Notice how these opening verses refer to what God had done in Christ as happening in these last, or eschatological, days. What did the author of Hebrews mean by this? Why was eschatology so important to him? Well, right out of the gate in the first verse of the book of Hebrews, he wants them to know that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the words of prophecy that came before him. He says, long ago at many times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son or by his son. And that means Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that came before him. He is the coming of the Lord, coming of the day of the Lord, the entrance of the kingdom, the final word in human history that God wants to say that's found in Jesus. To understand eschatology in Hebrews, we have to wind our way through some twists and turns of Israel's history near the end of the Old Testament and into the time between the Old and New Testaments. During the monarchical period, Israel fell deeper and deeper into rebellion against God. God eventually sent the Assyrian army to drive the majority of northern Israelites into exile. Later on, God sent the Babylonian armies to do the same to Judah. Now, around 538 BC, a remnant of Israel and Judah returned to the Promised Land with the hope that God would pour out the judgments and blessings of the last days. But large-scale repentance never took place. And as a result, Israel was doomed to suffer for five centuries under the tyranny of the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and finally under the Roman Empire. During the time between the Old and New Testaments, most Jewish communities steadfastly held to the hope that God's final judgments and blessings of the last days would come. This hope was so important to them that they divided all of history into two great ages. They spoke of the time in which they lived as this age, the age of sin that resulted in Israel's failure and exile. And they also spoke of the age to come, the time when God would pour out his final judgments on his enemies and his final glorious blessings on his faithful people. And based on Old Testament prophecies, they knew that God would send the great son of David, the Messiah, to bring about the transition from this age to the age to come. By focusing on eschatology, the author of Hebrews built on a belief he held in common with his audience and with the broader Jewish community. But at the same time, he pointed out time and again where those who believed in Jesus and those who did not parted ways. Unbelieving Jews held that the Messiah would bring a dramatic, catastrophic transition between this age and the age to come. But followers of Christ learned that Jesus was bringing the last days in three stages. The inauguration of his messianic kingdom in his first coming, the continuation of his messianic kingdom throughout church history, and the consummation of his messianic kingdom when he returned in glory. New Testament authors described all three of these stages as the last days in passages like Acts chapter 2 verse 17 and 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3. We can get a sense of the importance of this theme when we note that the author of Hebrews used familiar language for the last days on no less than six occasions. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5, he wrote of the world to come when Christ would return in glory. In chapter 6 verse 5, he referred to the powers of the coming age that many in his audience had experienced. In chapter 9 verse 11, 
he wrote of Christ as the priest of the good things that are already here. In chapter 9, verse 26, he referred to the time of Jesus' earthly ministry as the end of the ages. In chapter 10, verse 1, he spoke of the blessings resulting from Christ's sacrifice as the good things that are coming. And in chapter 13, verse 14, he described the final hope of Christ's followers as the city that is to come. The frequency of these well-known ways of referring to the last days gives us a glimpse into how significant this theme was to the author's purpose.